Welcome to the Dinosaur George podcast, a show about paleontology and other earth sciences. Dinosaur George is a public speaker, author, and TV host with 30 years of study in paleontology. He has performed live in over 4,500 events across the US and Canada. Now, here is Dinosaur George. Well, hey there, everybody. This is George from the Dinosaur George Company in San Antonio, Texas. We have been on the road nonstop with our traveling museum, but fortunately, I was able to find some time to uh, interview Dr. Devin O'Brien. Dr. O'Brien is with Colby College in Waterville, Maine, and he studies this incredible diversity of oddities. It's, it's so cool. I cannot wait to get him back on. Uh, his real focus is studying unusual insects, and he studies the evolution of extreme and bizarre morphology. That alone, that title alone tells you, oh my God, this is somebody we got to talk to. But the reason why I found Dr. O'Brien is I happened to see that he was doing a symposium on the canine evolution in saber-toothed cats. And I found that interesting. I thought the subject would be interesting. So I went ahead and interviewed him. I'll play his interview in just a moment. It's really fascinating. It's great stuff. He's a really nice guy, and I bet you guys are going to really enjoy hearing what he has to say. And I know if you are like me, you're going to be really excited about waiting to hear him do his his main interview, which is on the bizarre insects, because that, that's just so cool. I unfortunately don't have time to answer any questions on this particular podcast. Once again, my time is so limited. I'm so sorry. But hopefully I'll figure out a way to do more of these and get them out quicker than what I've been doing. So anyway, we're going to dive right in to Dr. O'Brien's interview. I hope you guys enjoy it. Here we go. All right, so I'm skulking on the internet looking for different exciting things, which is what I get to do, which I love. And I come across this information about a Dr. Devin O'Brien who is doing a symposium on the evolution of the canine tooth and saber tooth. And of course, I lose my mind. Because everybody loves the saber-toothed cats. And so I jump online and I Google Dr. O'Brien and I get to his webpage and I freak out. Because this man is an evolutionary biologist who is studying the extremes of some animals and insects. So we contacted him. Fortunately for us, Dr. O'Brien was kind enough. And, and I want to say this before I go any further, Dr. O'Brien. Not only were you kind enough to give us your time, but you were kind enough to reschedule it six different times. And this is late. I'm late in contacting you now. So with all of that said, Dr. O'Brien, welcome to our show. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, I, and I appreciate it. And seriously, for everybody listening, I'm not kidding you and he'll tell you. <laughs> We had scheduled this three or four or five different times. And every time I had something, not him, me, I had something come up. So <laughs> serious. Goes. Oh, my gosh. But it's so frustrating to do that. Do you mind if I call you Devin? Would that be OK? Please do. OK, absolutely. And again, for all of you young listeners, again, I want you all to understand when when somebody has gone through the amount of school and study and, and work that it takes to to become a, a doctor or Ph.D. Uh, or professor, it is important that you refer to those individuals that way first. And then if they are comfortable with being called by the first name and 99 and a half percent of them are, but I just wanted to show you the proper respect by referring to you as doctor instead of just, just starting. I think that's a great recommendation. Yeah. Okay. So first Devin, tell us a little bit just about yourself. Yeah. So, uh, I'm, I grew up in upstate New York. Uh, I have two parents and a sister. I grew up, Loving animals, not necessarily insects. That that came about a little later. But uh, I knew I wanted to work with animals pretty much my entire life. I uh, graduated high school, went to the University of Connecticut for my undergraduate degree, pursuing a degree in veterinary medicine. I got about a quarter of the way through that before I realized that uh, I don't like being told what to study and what to do. So I started pursuing the type of biology that I was very interested in. And that led me to kind of primary research, basic biology. And that's where I started studying the evolution of insects. Um, and in studying the evolution of insects, I got really interested in what I call the extremes, big and bizarre structures, things that are on animals that look like they shouldn't exist. And that brought me into my PhD work at the University of Montana, where I worked on the evolution of sexually selected weapons. Um, 
I worked on sexually selected weapons for a, a long time. As you alluded to, PhDs take a ferociously long time to complete, uh, studying the evolution of animal weapons in the wild, measuring selection, uh, looking at different traits and how they help and hurt uh, different animals. And I graduated from there and moved on to Colby College, where I am now as a postdoctoral researcher, uh, working on still weird and bizarre traits. Now we work on bug wings, uh, but still work on animal weapons a little bit. And uh, yeah, and throughout that, I've been working on dinosaurs and fossils as well, because I think they're cool and also weird and bizarre. So they fit right in. Well, you know, it, it's great that you mentioned that you recognized after you began your education that the field you already chose was not the field that you necessarily thought it would be, I guess. Oh yeah, man. That's, that's great because so many people are so afraid that first they have to make the definitive choice when they go to college. And it's so early and so difficult, you know, and you're not locked in. And I think that's, it is an important thing to realize. You can always change if you find something cool and interesting and, uh, you know, there's always people around. I had a lot of help doing that. There were people around the university that were also crazy biologists and really excited about insects. And they were as happy as I was to make the switch. And yeah, you can always switch. And there's always people around to help you out with that. Man, that's great. So now you are with uh, the biology department at Colby College, and that's in Waterville, Maine, right? Correct. Yep. Right. And so a website uh, for everybody, you can visit uh, uh, Dr. O'Brien's website at Devin M. O'Brien, D E V I N M O B R I E N dot Weebly dot com. That takes us to your website. Man, I looked at your website and just, I, I didn't want to go too much into the insect world because I want that to be the focus of a future podcast, which I hope you'll consider doing. Oh, and it'll fill a podcast too. And oh. I think it's fun. Yeah. God, well, everybody can go in their backyard and look at insects. That's one of the reasons why I was excited. Not everybody oh, I, has a saber tooth cat that they have access to. No, no, <laughs> but, <laughs> not most. But man, that's so cool. And so, so briefly, before we get into the focus today, which is of course the canine evolution in a saber tooth cat, Smilodon in particular, um, what? Just briefly, give us a tease about some of the freakish things in nature that you see these weird, uh, these these weird. I call them kachkas and bar bizarre morphology. Tell us, yeah. give us a sneak about something really odd that you've worked on. Yeah. Well, there's, <clears throat> there's the normal weird stuff like horns and antlers and uh, big legs on beetles that they all use to fight. But I'd say one of the weirdest things I've worked on uh, or worked in conjunction with are what's called the giraffe weevils. And these are weevils. Uh, weevils are beetles. They have kind of these long noses and the giraffe weevils have really long necks that they use to fight one another. The males have these really long necks and the males use those necks to fight one another over access to females. Um, fighting like giraffes, they smack their necks up against one another and spar and knock each other off branches. And they are just some of the weirdest, silly looking animals I've ever seen. And they are wicked cool and really fun to study. And you know, I've seen pictures of only of, of the animal itself, not in yeah. combat. It looks like something Dr. Seuss invented. Yeah, it doesn't look like it should be real. And that's really what inspires a lot of my research. I see something, and I'm like, that shouldn't happen. That <laughs> shouldn't exist. And that's kind of where I get to, I have to know more. And, and I mean, that's why I got into the saber-toothed cats. That's why I got into a lot of these weird insects. Like it's just it's something doesn't make sense when you see a picture of it, and you got to figure out more. You should create a new site called The Science of nah. -uh. Yeah, no. -uh. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> God, I am, let me tell you, I am really excited about doing a follow-up to talk about some of this. And you know what I'll do, especially with insects, when we do that, I'll find as many images of these oddities, or if you have images you can send, then I'll be able to put them up on the video podcast version so people can see what you're talking about. Because I, I guess you can't even describe some of these things. No, it's difficult. If you've never seen it before, it's... I mean, you're like you said, it's something from Dr. Seuss. You, it, you can't picture natural biology that that's weird. That is that weird unless you've seen it. It's, it's something else. <laughs> All right. So what brought me to you and made lucky enough for us to find you was I, I'm going through, and I don't remember where I saw it, but I see this notice of a symposium on titled Canine Evolution in a Saber-Toothed Cat. What brought you to that? And then let's talk about what you found in your research. Yeah, so uh, maybe... Two or three years ago, 
uh, I started this study looking at these extreme and bizarre traits across all different kinds of animals. Uh, we did a study, it had something like 25 different animals, uh, everything from the beetles I've been talking to you about to grizzly bears to, uh, I think there was giant anteaters in the study, all these crazy things. And basically it was this mix of animals that fall into that, uh, what are you talking about category? And what I really wanted to figure out was, is there something about the size and shape of these animals, these particular traits that we're interested in, that can tell us something interesting about the biology of the animals? So normally when biologists are trying to figure out what a trait or what a structure does, they go out in the wild and they study the animal. But sometimes that's difficult for various reasons. If we're talking about extinct organisms like we will be today, it's obviously impossible. But you have animals that are endangered, animals that are places of the world that aren't safe for biologists to travel to. And so the question is, what do we do when we want to understand those animals that we can't access? So again, this idea was, well, if we can get museum specimens of these animals, we can take all these different measurements and we can use those measurements to say something interesting about the animal's behavior, their biology, and maybe how those traits evolved. Within that study, I looked at a couple different uh, extinct organisms. I looked at a pterosaur and a protoceratops uh, as kind of proof of concept that these ideas can be used to say something interesting about extinct organisms, especially where I think this problem of no observation is both uh, the most problematic and the most uh, immediately intuitive, right? Obviously, we can't study these extinct animals. And I te teamed up with Dave Hone to do that, who you've had on the podcast before. Right. Yeah. And um, long story short, that study strongly suggested that we could, in fact, use what we call those measures of static morphology, morphology that is just the way it is, those measures of morphology to say something interesting about these animals. And <clears throat> that publication got a little bit of attention. And through that, I was invited to uh, the symposium that you saw me at. Uh, or heard about me giving at uh, the Society for Integrative and Comparative Biology. And what they asked me to do was speak about that paper, but also do a little more and maybe add a new data set to the study, say something interesting about a new animal. And so I was thinking for a while, I was like, okay, what animal can I apply this study to? And I'm, you know, you're going through your Rolodex in the back of your head trying to think of all those weird animals we've talked about. And for a while now, I've been really interested in the saber toothed cat for no scientific reason, just because I think it's a really cool animal, right? right? I mean, these things are, they're weird. I've been interested in them since I was a kid, just looking at them. They're bizarre. They're cool. So I was like, wow, this is a great opportunity to work on an animal that I've loved my entire life with uh, an analysis that I have worked on and invented, for lack of a better term, myself. Uh, and so I got to combine kind of my childhood passions and my, you know, grown up scientific knowledge into this saber tooth cat study. And, and here we are. God. Now, when you talk about biology for our younger listeners, animals, I guess, are sort of constructed with a basic standard it, with that. It, it, so you have a starting point, I guess, that can you that can you apply the modern animals today to those extinct animals and at least have the basic foundation to say this is how motion works this is how an animal moves do you use that to to kind of form your opinion of prehistoric life absolutely i mean <clears throat> there is there's an optimistic way to look at that and there's a cynical way to look at it the optimistic way is that you know yeah i mean tetrapods are tetrapods and they move in a similar way maybe not the exact same way you know, a couple million years ago as they do now, especially when we're talking about relatively small time frames in the, in the span of all evolution, things like Smilodon are around 10,000 years ago. That's a blink. These animals are not far gone. And yeah, looking at the, the modern organisms give us a lot of information about the extinct organisms. Looking at the extant organisms gives us a lot of information about the extinct organisms. And that is because there's kind of this basic body plan uh, within taxa. You know, it varies a lot of cross taxa. Obviously, I can't look at an extinct nematode and get an idea of what's going on and, sure. and, and smile it on. But, right. but if I'm looking at large cats today and large cats then, those are largely uh, the same thing. The more cynical side of it is that this is all we have, right? I mean, we can't go and study these organisms 
while they were alive, they've been dead a really long time. And so in a way, we're making the best of a bad situation. We're doing what we can with what we've got. And yeah, it might not be the most accurate interpretation of, of this data, but uh, I mean, we have good reason to believe that it is, or at least close. And, and so we go as far as we can with that information. Right. Now, in your in your focus on Smilodon, were you able to access uh, various fossils in different places to look to be able to determine whether your your ideas were accurate or did you look more towards modern cats as as kind of your basis for why those teeth got so big? Uh, A little bit of both. I mean, so the data analysis that I did myself was on data collected from directly from fossil uh, specimens. I did this great thing in biology or in science that you can do is I, I searched in the literature, right? I mean, there's a lot of publications, a long history of studying these animals. So I was able to source data from people that had easy access to these fossils, which I don't. I live in Maine and the fossils are in Los Angeles. It's difficult to get there. And so I sourced this data on the actual animals and I analyzed fossil data. And then in writing my paper and, and giving the presentation you heard about and interpreting the results from my analysis, that's when I went to the extant organisms. I looked a lot at things like clouded leopards, which are you know extant felids that do have long canines, similar to the saber-toothed cat. Uh, and there's been a lot of people that have looked at those in relation to saber-toothed cats and other cats in relation to saber-toothed cats, both uh, in the context of morphology, but also in the context of behavior. There's been some interesting studies that look at how uh, the morphology are the shapes and sizes of the saber-toothed cats match those of modern felids like lions and how that might be connected to behavior and whether or not the behavior of extinct animals to extinct cats were similar to things like lions. Uh, so I would really lean on studies like that to interpret my data and to figure out, okay, what do these numbers I came up with actually mean in biological terms in the context of the animal? But yeah, I mean, it's not all me. It's a, it's this big scientific community coming together, reading that literature from everywhere and, and combining that to come up with this cool idea, this cool study. So was the focus of your study, did the end result, did you want the end result to be why did they evolve them or was it was it um was it a need to evolve i look at some of these modern animals today Uh, we have we have warthogs with these knobs and stuff all over their face and the first question for me is why that doesn't seem to serve a purpose so Mm -hmm. what drove you to want to look at the at Smilodon, for instance, was it, why are those teeth so big? Or was it, why are they curved? Or was it, why did they use them? What drove you to want to look into them? Yeah, I think this goes back to my interest in big and bizarre and things that don't make sense. I think my question is how, how can this possibly exist? And that often leads me to why did it evolve? Right. But my, my gut going in, what interests me is like, how the heck is this true? How the heck is this real? Um, but the best way to answer, how is this real is why did it come to be the way it is? Absolutely. And so in wondering how, in that big question of how, uh, the, the question asked in the publication, in the research is why. Right. So what, what would, what did you, what did you determine? What did you determine? First, let's talk about how. How did a cat, because from the fossil record, from the things that the average person gets to see, we see little cat-like critters, and suddenly we see this monstrosity with these enormously long teeth. Did your research take you into sort of the evolutionary trail? Did you see previous animals who had smaller versions, and did they progress? Or evolution to me is this weird thing that we we the general public we the the ones that don't necessarily study at your level we see evolution as this slow and steady track mm-hmm. but then when you look at animals like the saber tooth it looks like evolution has certain weekends where it goes out and gets drunk yeah and goes nuts so did you see did were you able to did your research take you to the earlier versions that it looked like that was a progression to those canines or did Smilodon wake up one day and go, what the heck are these? Yeah, um, my research went the other way, right? So you can approach this trait from two directions. What right. came before it or what came after it. Nice. And 
So I didn't as much look at all the closely related organisms, extinct organisms of Smilodon and try to figure out, try to reconstruct the evolutionary trends that led to large canines. That is absolutely a valid way to do evolutionary biology, and a lot of people do it. What I did instead was I worked backwards. I looked, okay, what are the kind of evolutionary trends that give us these similar types of morphology in extant organisms, living organisms, and can I apply those same trends to the extinct organism and try to figure out what's going on here? Wow. So do you have an opinion of the, the teeth being so large? Is it like, like let's say, for instance, uh, a moose. You know, right. you look at a moose and, and the more mature the moose becomes, the more ornate the, the antlers become and the larger they become. As as an observer, I would think that that would be a sign to all other moose. I'm a mature adult male. Maybe a female yep. sees that as an attraction that says, if if my job is to take an, another moose into the next generation, I want the best dad out there. Yep. So do you think those teeth were evolved for functionality of killing and, and feeding or, or were they or were they ornaments? Yeah, I, that's a great question. And that is what the the question became with this paper. We have these two hypotheses going in. So the question is, what or how did these canines evolve in these animals? And we have two main hypotheses. The one is the the first is the intuitive one that these are teeth. Animals use their teeth for hunting and in large canines and saber tooth cats evolved as these really specialized, albeit bizarre hunting tools. The other is the second hypothesis is that these large teeth and saber tooth cats evolved as what we call uh, weapons of male male competition, intra sexually selected weapons. And that is uh, evolutionarily the same thing as something like the antlers of a moose. And why that's the case is a little more difficult to understand, but we can get into it. There's the surface explanation of why you might think that's the case. And then there's kind of the deep biology explanation. The surface explanation is you look at saber tooth cats and their canines look much more similar to other sexually selected weapons than they do to any other predation trait we see out there. And so things are, that are sexually selected weapons that look like the canines of saber tooth cats include the tusks of walruses, the tusks of elephants, the tusks of warthogs, uh, the enlarged canines of non-human primates, so things like gorillas have these enlarged canines. They do use those as signals to other males in competition. They use them to fight. Even the tusks of narwhals. These are all bony tooth structures that are used to first fight. They're used by males to fight other males over reproductive access to females. And then they're used as signals to other males and females that they are these high-quality, strong males. They're good at fights. And, you know, this is a male that a female wants to mate with. He does have these good genes that he can pass on to his offspring. And and so those are our two hypotheses, our two ideas going into the scenario. Well, you know, I, I never once until the moment we were talking ever considered, even cons ever thought that those teeth could be display. Because the thing that's the most frustrating about saber tooth, all the focus is the structural design, did they have any strength lateral side to side yeah. movement? And if not, then were they, the, the question is, how are they using them? Well, nobody stops to think, well, nobody but you stops to think that the possibility exists that they are simply display and right. not necessarily <laughs> for killing and eating. Because when you look at the skull of a saber tooth cat to eat, those things seems like they would be more of a detriment in eating. Absolutely. Because it would be like, it would be like us taking two chopsticks and inserting them up in our upper lip and stick them in front of our mouth and then try to put food in your mouth. Yeah. Yeah. They just get in the way. Yeah, right. They're a stopgap. So do you have an opinion? Were you able to formulate an opinion based on what you studied? Do you believe that they were dual purpose or singular? And if singular, what were they for? Right. And so, through the study, uh, we, we were able to figure out that the canines of saber-toothed cats do not function as signals or weapon signals of competition. Um, looking at 
what we call the scaling relationship of these traits, the way within a population, trait size, canine size changes with body size, that pattern is much more similar to things like predation tools, more traditional predation tools, than it is to other sexually selected weapons, things like the antlers of the moose you mentioned, or any of those tooth structures that I, I, I mentioned before. And so through that, we could throw away that hypothesis. We know that we could reject that hypothesis, right? We know that these saber tooth cat fangs are not, the canines are not a sexually selected signal. So then the question, of course, is, well, then what are they? And from here on out, we kind of have two hypotheses that we need to, of course, do another study to figure out. And that's how this always works, right? You, you reject one thing and then, okay, now we have to do a follow-up study. But the two ideas are that these serve some type of singular purpose, like you mentioned. They only do one thing. They don't have a signal function. They are either pure, what we call pure weapons of male-male competition. And these pure weapons are weapons that males use still to fight other males over reproductive access to females, but they don't use them at all for a signal. They don't represent any type of condition, any type of quality, any type of competitive ability in these individuals. They're weapons and they're weapons only. The other idea, the other singular purpose that they could have is pure hunting tools. These really could be these weird adaptations for hunting and the animals use them to catch prey, ambush prey, take down large prey. And uh, they were these expert hunters with these weird tooth morphologies that we just don't understand yet. And the methods I talked about earlier where I was looking at all these extreme traits, that allowed me to differentiate between that signal purpose and those singular purposes that I just mentioned. But what it doesn't allow me to do is differentiate between those those singular purposes. And we need a follow up and a new study to do that. Right. So when you determined based on the evidence you saw, um, when you determined that they were not used as signaling or display, for lack yeah. of, of a scientific term, is that because the females didn't show any variance or do you see a variance in the tooth between male and female? We don't. Um, so the reason we don't think it's a signal uh, kind of has two parts, right? So it doesn't scale with body size. It doesn't change with body size like uh, those traits I mentioned did, those signal traits, those display traits I mentioned do. And then, yeah, there's no what we call sexual dimorphism in the saber-toothed cats. And so sexual dimorphism simply means differences between sexes. So the males look different than the females. Uh, and that is one of the hallmarks, kind of these characteristic features of sexually selected structures, weapons included. So if you think about a deer or a moose, the males have these big antlers and the females don't. If we look at something like a caribou where females do have antlers, what we see is that the differences are in the size of the structure. So they're still dimorphic, even though they both have the structure. When we look at the saber tooth cats, both males and females do have these canines. So they're maybe closer to the, uh, the caribou than they are to the moose. But unlike the caribou, these are the exact same size structures. When we look at the, the size of the canines, the length, and the width of the canines compared to body size, there's no difference between the males and the females. And that's one of our big clues. No sexual dimorphism often means that there's no sexual selection. Not always, but combined with the other clues we were able to get from the study, yeah, it was one of our contributing factors to determining what was going on here. Right. Right. That oh, that makes a lot of sense. And, and then also you mentioned that there's not a dramatic change of size difference based on the size of the specimen so a young yeah. male might have the exact same size canines as an older male perhaps and therefore you wouldn't be able from a distance to recognize who's the more mature i guess if they were i, I guess my point is if they were display you would expect the young ones to have a distinctively shorter tooth to body size right than say a, a, a fully mature adult male yeah, that is correct. But when I'm talking about scaling across body sizes, I'm mostly talking about adults. And so ah, got it. when we look at these signal structures, what we see is that even across adults, even across adults, we see immense variation in the trait size. And so if you think of something like, uh, I don't know, arm size in humans, the tallest human and the shortest human both have proportional arm sizes. The arm size relative to their body size is roughly the same. When we're looking at these signal structures, that's not at all the case. So the smallest adult moose has disproportionately small antlers compared to his body size, compared to the largest moose in a population has disproportionately large antlers compared to his body size. 
And so what we're looking at is scaling in these studies across adults in the population rather than what we call ontogenetic scale, like scaling across a lifetime of an organism. And that's really what clues us into that signaling. Wow. Function. So you say there's more study that you need to do. So I'm going to ask you some questions about the, the cat itself that you may not have begun to study in detail yet. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to ask you some. So, so first, um, one of the things that, that I, I look at when I look at the, the skull of a saber tooth is you have these two protruding, enormous pointed fangs for lack of a better term. If a cat were to break one of them, let's say one of them broke, wouldn't the broken tooth almost act like a stopgap to keep the other from penetrating any farther in than where the break is. You, you, you see what I mean? Like if you look at the cross section, let's say a tooth is broken. Now, instead of having a pointy edge, you have a flat surface flat edge, of, yeah. of, the, of the tooth to drive the tooth into the prey is obviously easier. If you have a pointed object That's going in. Saying. So if you have a flattened one, would that be a detriment what the point i'm trying to get to maybe i'm taking a long about turn i'm trying to understand why those canines of that proportion didn't perpetuate through the history and why we don't still have saber tooth cats maybe that's the proper way to ask yeah why do we lose them right did you um, have your studies given you any insight into that yet yeah let me think well <clears throat> There's a couple things that can happen. I mean, life is a cost benefit analysis, right? I mean, for any trait, there's some type of benefit for the organism, and then there's some type of associated cost. And both of those things, the cost and the benefit, are not happening in a vacuum. They're a function of the environment. And so when we see traits evolve and then disappear, looking at these wide, you know, wide lens views of evolutionary history, what we have to think about is, okay, what changed about the environment that this trait is no longer beneficial? And that can be the social environment, that can be how the animal interacts with both members of its own species and others, but it can also be things like the climate, uh, predator-prey dynamics, things like that. It can also be breakage, things like you're describing where the tooth could break and then become a detriment rather than, than a benefit. Um, I tend to find that less likely in the sense that if a tooth tends to break, I think those animals whose teeth break will tend to be purged from the population. And then right. these organisms may, I'm not always adapt and maybe gain stronger teeth or slightly reduce. And you'd get this optimum of tooth strength and tooth size. What I suspect, and I mean, this is a blind guess. I, I do not know is that the environment of these animals likely changed in some way that the cost of having these big teeth, then there's a cost to everything. The cost of having these big teeth started to outweigh the benefits. These organisms went extinct or changed, adapted into some other type of morphology. Um, that all being said, we do see some saber tooth organisms today. I mean, I've listed all those different animals that have big saber teeth. Those are sexually selected ones. But we also do see some saber tooth hunting organisms too. I mean, there's some snakes with huge fangs that are way bigger than they have to be to inject venom into their prey. And we also see some fields. I think I mentioned the clouded leopard earlier that do have enlarged canines that appear to function as hunting tools. We don't really know they're hard animals to study, but um, I mean, maybe that's still around and maybe we can gain some information of the saber tooth cat's behavior, why it came about. And then perhaps more interestingly, why it went away from those extant organisms. Well, what a great comment to mention the cost of the tooth. You know, we all, we often don't understand. I think young people understand when you put it in terms like this, you get a new video game and here's the all upgrades that you get, but you're yeah. limited because you simply can't be, you can't be invisible. You can't have endless weapons unless you know the cheat codes, but life doesn't give us cheat codes. Yeah. There's no cheat codes in evolution. <laughs> yeah, right. So these animals are, are, I just thinking about the, the strain on the animal to develop canines of that size, the yeah. amount of, of uh, calcium, Oh, yeah. So, I mean, you have you're talking about resources going into the structure during development as the organism ages. Um, you're talking about maintenance costs. So, you know, there's turnover in those tissues. You need to keep putting uh, resources into those tissues. And then they're heavy. Right. I mean, this is bone. Right. There's the cost of just the energy that's required for an uh, individual with big canines to carry them around. The muscle required in the head 
to keep it up. That's metabolically expensive. That takes energy. So yeah, you're talking about developmental costs, maintenance costs, and then not to mention the cost if it breaks and then you can't eat. I mean, for a long time, that clearly was benefit uh, outweighed by the benefits of the trait, but uh, maybe it wasn't always. Well, you know, we see in the fossil record, there's other animals that there are marsupial uh, the marsupial uh, Thylocus smilus, the Gorgonopsians from the Permian, all predating dinosaurs. We see other cats, Homotherium, um, Xenosmilus. They all have larger than modern canines, but not to the extent of, of Smilodon. So I guess it would make you contemplate the idea that the cost for those teeth just didn't work when the environment began to change and maybe that's why our modern cats don't have the incredibly long canines yeah i mean from my admittedly ignorant view of insect biology (laughs) trying to dabble into paleontology and big cats i think that's reasonable (laughs) (laughs) well one thing about when when you can the way you look at your your insect studies nature doesn't just add things for the sake of adding it they all have a purpose right at least initially there would be a purpose for evolution to add an extremely long neck on a weevil or giant teeth yeah i mean when you're talking so i want to shy away from saying that there's always reason and purpose behind evolution i mean there is a lot of really interesting theory about random walks in evolution where things can pop up and if they're not bad they can just persist because they're not bad Ah. but yeah we're When we're talking about these big structures that clearly have some type of cost, I mean, the giraffe weevil's neck makes it obvious to predators. It's big. It's going to have some metabolic cost. That thing's filled with muscle. I mean, when you see something that's big and weird like that, yeah, that probably serves some type of some type of purpose. Right. And and to your point about yeah, evolution not following the guidelines and and doing what we think would make sense. Because we do have in the fossil record a lot of what are considered evolutionary dead ends where you have these animals that are completely and absolutely unique to everything, but they do not move forward in history. And it could be because what was tried didn't necessarily work. Or what worked didn't work any longer when the environment changed, too. Yeah. And, and that's a great point about these saber tooth cats. Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, what works and what doesn't is so context dependent, right? Oh, sure. And and yeah. to your point that you made at the very beginning of the interview, man, you've got such limited ways to understand that. Like, for instance, we can look at the fossil record and we can tell you the basic weather conditions right. and we can tell you who's living with the saber tooth cat. But we can't reach in and watch from a distance to see how these cats are working. And so I understand the frustration you must face. And how frustrating is it when you don't have those answers in front of you? Is it because you're studying insects, you can at least watch the little critters. Does it bother you or does it encourage you? I would say it encourages me. I mean, you're absolutely right. When you're studying insects and you're studying extant animals, I mean, a lot of my PhD work was going into the jungle and watching beetles and just literally watching evolution and selection happen. I measured selection over a series of seasons. I could watch evolution happen. And then you come up against these fossil organisms that are so cool. And it's just like, bam, it's over. <laughs> right? You're at a dead end. Uh, and you need to start guessing. And I'm not used to guessing. Uh, but I think that being used to looking at animals critically and just being able to watch them and understand was really an inspiration for trying to come up with something a little new. I mean, I I came from the outside here. I'm not a paleontologist by training. And I think that helped me. I mean, I was used to watching animals in the wild. I was used to being able to observe my study species. And that kind of gave me this, I don't know, extra bit of energy to figure out a new way to look at fossil species. I just, I wasn't willing to accept that. Well, we can't know anything because they're dead. I was like, no, there's gotta be more. And so yeah, it's frustrating, but in a really exciting way. I mean, it's it's like, I, I relate to solving a puzzle, right? I love puzzles. I love games and I love puzzles. And and coming up against something like that, to me, is solving a puzzle. And it's, it's, it's frustrating sometimes, like a puzzle, but, you know, net across the board, it's a lot of fun. Well, where your research is now, were you surprised by anything? Did something completely catch you off guard or did it change your opinion 
about what you thought you knew about the teeth on these cats? Yeah, I mean, right, you're not supposed to have preconceived notions going into science, but you can't help it. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I went in, I was thinking, I mean, I've spent a lot of time looking at sexually selected traits, these animal weapons I've been talking about. And you get comfortable, right? So I get to this idea in my head that I'm like, okay, there's nothing that can produce bizarre traits like this except sexual selection. And I mean, that's hyperbole, and I probably shouldn't think that way, but there's actually some data to back that up, that sexual selection is an especially strong force in evolution and gives us these big traits. And so going in, I'm like, these are huge. These, got to, these have to be the product of sexual selection. And they're not. And so, and I'm convinced they're not. And I think it was really a, a moment to, to check those preconceived notions going into, into a study. And I think it was a good reminder that we can't have those preconceived notions going into biology. And it helped me think about that a little more critically, both within my kind of subfield of sexual selection. Hey, not all these bizarre traits are sexually selected structures, but it's good to take a step back and have that perspective about science and biology in general. I mean, I could have been clouded by that opinion if I went about that study a different way. And that can be a dangerous thing. Luckily, I wasn't. But uh, so, yeah, it was, it was a bit of a, a, a moment to check those preconceived notions. Well, you know, I'm, I'm so glad you said that. One of my favorite uh, scientists is Dr. Uh, Larry Whitmer from Ohio University. Yep. And, and I had the, the great pleasure of interviewing him once as well. And he made a comment that has stuck with me since. And he said very plainly, scientists are people, too. Yeah. And so you're right. You're not supposed to go in with a preconceived notion as a scientist. That's got to be an internal battle. Let's say you've dedicated your life to studying, let, let's say that, that beautiful giraffe looking weevil, which I just find fascinating. And you have seen and you've studied this and then you find out that what you've been thinking is wrong. That would seem incredibly difficult to let that go. It, yeah. Because you're a human. You're, you're, you're not a robot. A scientist isn't a robot that walks in with, like you said, you don't walk in with a blank slate. And you start yep. from the beginning. You got to start with something. How difficult a struggle can that be for for someone if you've dedicated a lot of your time and effort into it? It's so hard. I mean, biologists especially. I mean, really get into their field because they love plants, animals. I know people that love bacteria more than anything else. I mean, biologists get into their systems because they love their systems. And yeah, we're driven by questions, but. You study a beetle, you sit in the woods with a beetle for five years and you start to like that animal a lot. <laughs> right. And um, that's a good thing. I mean, it means that you always have more questions. You're always hungry to know more, but you do occasionally come up against roadblocks. And uh, one of the biggest roadblocks I notice in biology is you fall in love with this animal and it's not the ideal animal for you to study your questions and it doesn't make sense. And so you have to switch to a different organism. And people have trouble doing that. They try to answer questions and study systems that aren't ideal just because they love the system. And it, it's uh, it's sometimes a move is necessary. But the other side of that, I think, is that if you love your organ, I know biologists that have made their whole career just sticking with an organism because they love that organism more than anything else. And there's questions that just literally keep them awake at night, just wanting to know more about that animal. Um, so, yeah, the struggle's real. I mean, it's hard to put away an organism, but... If you love it enough, you don't have to. You really have to. Well, you know, fortunately for society, it is scientists who have that love that open up the world for the rest of us. You right. know, we, we don't get to go into the jungle and study. But fortunately, people like you do. You publish your work. You make that work available. And like you, taking time out of your schedule today um, and eating up all of your time today with <laughs> me being late to this interview you're still willing to take the time to share that. And I guarantee you that by the conclusion of this interview, there are going to be people that are going to go right to Google and they're going to try to find out what this weevil is you're talking about. I guarantee <laughs> I so. you. It's a crazy animal. Yeah, that's uh, so cool. But I appreciate yeah, I you doing that. This. I mean, it's important and it's fun, right? I mean, science isn't worth much if scientists keep it to themselves, right? I mean, we're a select few people. Right. If we kept this within our own circles, I mean, then the benefit to humanity for gaining more knowledge 
is, is kind of lost. So I think it's very important to share what we find with the, the world. Um, and I think it's fun too. I mean, like I said before, we as biologists are passionate about these animals. I think one of the, the best things, the best thing about my job and what I do is getting to have conversations like this and watching you go nuts over something that I'm interested in. Right. right. I mean, those people Googling the draft weevil that go bananas for it tonight didn't know about it before. So now I have people out there that love what I love even more. And so it's important to share that knowledge. It's also just a blast to watch people have fun with what you have fun doing. Well, I could guarantee you, I'm going to go look it up because uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I saw on your website, uh, I think it's in the what's new. You have information about it. You have, um, you have images of it. I think I, either that or I, I saw think so. it. So I think the what's new links to my Twitter and the collaborator. I work with uh, Chrissy painting who does the, has done the bulk of research on the draft weevil. I'm just, I'm basically, when I say I do work on the draft weevil, I mean, I study the same things and I'm friends with people that do work on the draft weevil and I just love it. Right. Um, Chrissy Painting's Twitter, I think got linked through there. So you can go, go to her page too and check it out. That may have been, yeah, you know what it was because what I did is when I did my research after finding out ab about what the work you were doing with the saber tooth, and then I went to your site and then your site is sort of like the rabbit hole that took me off looking at all kinds yeah. of stuff. And I see that, that humped back, long necked yep. strangest looking critter on planet earth and i'm I'm telling you i cannot wait to steal more of your time to go into that stuff because all the yeah. insects are amazing anyway but that thing yeah is i mean i have my beetles that are the frog-legged beetles that have big nutcrackers for legs instead of normal legs i oh mean my that's my God. main system those are one of my favorites too God. oh they're so cool so those those are the animals you'll see the most on my website is the the frog-legged beetles but god evolution when it comes to insects just much roll they must roll it just rolls the dice let's do this one <laughs> yeah and i mean there's and i guess to tease more stuff i mean when we talk again there's reasons that that might be more possible in insects and other animals and and those reasons are cool oh my god well he is dr Devin o'brien and he is the postdoctoral researcher from the biology department at Colby College in Waterville, Maine. His website is Devin M. O'Brien, spelled D-E-V-I-N-M-O-B-R-I-E-N dot Weebly, W-E-E-B-L-Y dot com. Uh, there's a way to contact you through there. Uh, can we can we uh, follow you on Twitter or do you have yeah, Facebook and Twitter? Do you, yeah, my Twitter's linked through the website. It's also just Devin M. O'Brien. That's where you'll find me. Excellent. Well, I cannot tell you how much we appreciate, and I'm telling you right now that my mind is racing a million miles an hour about the insects because this podcast that I do is dedicated to earth sciences. It's not solely paleontology. Uh, kids yep. nicknamed me Dinosaur George because I go to schools, I teach about dinosaurs, but my love is is science and nature. It's geology, right. it's biology, it's all of the ologies that, that get people up out of their house and into their backyard. I can't get people to go out and look for saber tooths in their backyard, but I can certainly get them to go Find out as they look for insects. And so yeah. maybe we should immediately form a, a company to sell micro microscopes and, and uh, magnifying lenses for these kids to go out and, there you and, go. and look for this stuff. Man, we appreciate this, uh, Dr. O'Brien. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day. Yeah, I really it's appreciate it. A lot of fun, it. a pleasure. Yeah, we'd love to have you back. Great, thanks. I'd love to come back. Well, I told you it was going to be cool. <laughs> Tell me you're not excited about hearing the evolution of extreme and bizarre morphology of insects. It's going to be awesome. And I'll make sure to post a lot of pictures as well so that you can see some of these oddballs that uh, Dr. O'Brien. Uh, that Dr. O'Brien studies. Uh, thank you so much uh, to Dr. O'Brien for taking the time out. And, you know, I, I've got to admit really, really upsetting that, that I had to keep putting him off and keep changing the schedule because of my schedule. And he was so kind and so courteous that allowed me to, to do that. So I really, really appreciate him uh, uh, being that, that courteous to us and, and letting us do that. Uh, for all of you guys out there, if uh, you're interested in having my traveling museum come to your community, Go to our website, dinosaurgeorge.com, and click on the museum page, and there you can find information about what we do and how to get in touch with us. Also, if you're interested, uh, we have a website catalog. You can find it at dinosaurgeorge.com as well, and we have a variety of different kind of cool stuff. Unfortunately, 
we no longer ship outside of North America. I, I am so, so sorry about this. We've had so much trouble with tracking packages and packages not being delivered. And it, it just it just got to the point where it was almost impossible to, to deal with. Not all countries, but but some. And so, unfortunately, we no longer ship outside of the U.S., but if I can, or outside of North America, we still ship to Canada, I believe. Uh, but uh, I'm trying to figure out a way to work around that, and hopefully we can. In the meantime, thank you all so much for taking the time to listen to this podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. If you have a subject you'd like to hear, go to our website again, dinosaurgeorge.com, and click on the Ask Dinosaur George page, and that will drop down a, a form that you can fill out and submit, and you can submit your questions. I'm going to try to do an upcoming video of nothing but answering all of the questions you are submitting. I apologize. I can't get to them now but uh, soon, one day soon. Until then, take care of yourself, take care of the people around you, and be kind to people. It's so much nicer to be nice than to be rude and hateful because then you got to spend your life worrying about who you, who you offended, who you made mad. Look, if you're just kind, then people that get offended easily, there's nothing you can do about that, but it's not your fault. Starting a fight, that's your fault. So anyway, take care. I will talk to you guys soon. Take care, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Dinosaur George Show. Please follow us on our social media links and join our mailing list. If you're interested in having Dinosaur George speak at your event, please visit our website at dinosaurgeorge.com.